Hello again. Today we're going to be looking at the probably the last aspect of genetics. Um, so far we have um, delved into um, so many things about this particular topic, actually vast, on genetics. The first one we talked about um, the meaning of genetics and we looked at some terminologies um, used <clears throat> in the topic called genetics. Um, we also discussed, and I think genetics too, we looked at Mendel's experiment. <clears throat> Mendel is regarded as the father of genetics. We saw his two experiments, or uh, the experiment he carried out in two um, different forms. And um, we also looked at um, some of the theories, um, laws, if I may say, he propounded from his experiment. And then also we talked about um, back cross, test cross. We also looked at the principles of, com of incomplete dominance. We looked at sex determinations, mostly in humans. We also discussed something very important. Again, we talked about the chromosomes. We looked at the structure of the DNA. We looked at the appearance of the chromosomes during cell division. We also looked at a whole lot of things we talked about. But today we're actually going to be looking at something very wonderful still in genetics. And um, today we are going to be looking at sex linkage in humans. We're going to be talking about sex linkage in humans. We're also going to be looking at application of the principle of heredity. We want to see how heredity or genetics is applied in our everyday life. We are also going to be talking about a sweet and wonderful topic called genetic engineering. Genetic engineering. We're going to just briefly look, look at it. Um, so these are the areas we're going to be touching in this last aspect of genetics. And um, <clears throat> before I continue, I'd like us to look at our specific objective which is um, by the end of this class, you should be able to briefly explain um, sex linkage in humans. You should also be able to uh, mention the applications of the principles of heredity and also briefly explain what we mean by genetic engineering. All right. So these are the areas you are expected to be able to tell or explain by the end of this class or this particular topic. Um, if you're set, I'm also ready, let's begin. Now, let's talk about the first topic or subtopic here is sex linkage in humans. Sex linkage in humans. Now, characteristics whose genes are carried in the X chromosomes. If you could remember um, in Genetics 3, we talked about X and Y chromosomes. We said the X and Y chromosomes are located mostly in males. And then we talked about the X chromosome, which is located in females. And I told you that these X chromosomes or X and Y chromosomes, they are called um, sex chromosomes. They are called sex, sex chromosomes. So characteristics whose genes are carried in the X chromosome of the sex chromosomes are said to be sex linked. So when, what, what we mean by sex linkage, it simply means um, 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 chromosomes that are, or, or, yes, chromosomes that carry genes that are located in the X chromosomes or genes that are located in the X chromosomes are called sex linkage. Okay, they are called sex-linked genes. Now, a sex-linked gene is actually a gene that is located in the X chromosome. Now, we have several um, um, types of sex linkage or sex-linked genes, which we're going to be looking at. Now, examples of sex-linked genes are controlled by a recessive gene located on the X chromosome. Now, let's take a look at some of the examples of sex-linked characters or traits that are found mostly in the X chromosome. The first one we're going to be looking at is what we call color blindness. Color blindness. Now, color blindness is actually a condition in which a person is unable to distinguish between near colors, between near 
colors. Now you can see on the screen there we have near colors. You see when a person is complete color blindness. The person is not able to see some colors. Everything almost appears to be black and white. So when a person is actually colorblind, it simply means the person is not able to differentiate between or distinguish between near colors. Now, what actually causes color blindness? Now, color blindness is caused by abnormality from the genes that produce the light receptors in the retina of the eye. Remember, the retina of the eye is where images are actually being formed. So there is actually supposed to be a, a, a kind of a gene that is responsible for the production of light receptor that produces light receptor that receives the lights inside the retina. So when light flashes on an image and it comes to the eye, the retina receives it. Okay, so the light receptor is what receives this channels the information to the brain, the brain uh, 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 interprets it and tells you the color you actually see. Now, once this light receptor is not produced or it has an abnormality in it, it brings about color blindness. It brings about color blindness. One more time, please note that color blindness can be caused by an abnormality from the genes that produce the light receptor which is located in the retina of the eye. Now the next example of sex-linked sex character is hemophilia. Hemophilia. Now hemophilia can also be called hemorrhage or you can also call it a bleeding disease. Now, there are several things that causes hemophilia. Now, hemophilia is actually a condition in which the blood is unable to clot when injury is sustained. And this is a very, very dangerous condition. Remember, when a person sustains any injury, their blood actually, the blood uh, vessels are being damaged and which causes um, blood to begin to gush out of the body. And um, one, one major thing that happens is that the cells in the blood, which is called the platelets, helps in bringing about a, a process which we call clotting. And that clotting helps to cover, pr produces a kind of a sheet that covers that particular part of the body or the skin that is being damaged or injured so as to prevent loss of blood and also prevent the invasion or also prevent the entering of um, pathogens into the body. So a condition where the body or the blood is unable to clot, we call that process or that condition hemophilia. And sometimes hemophilia is caused by um, lack of vitamin K lack of vitamin K can also bring about hemophilia. Now, as you can see in the screen, we have the normal blood vessel, as you can see there. And this, when hemorrhage happens, you see that the blood starts spilling out. Now, see what happens when a clotting takes place. Now, that is in a healthy person's body, while someone that is not having hemophilia. Now, look at the person that has hemophilia. The normal blood vessel, that's what it is. When injury takes place, the blood vessels are being punctured and then blood starts gushing out. That's what we call hemorrhage. Bleeding takes place. Then after bleeding, if clotting is unable to take place, you will see that, you, as you can also see on the screen, the body or that part of the blood vessels is not closed up. And as you can see, blood is still coming out of the body. So that is what we call hemophilia. And hemophilia is also sex-linked character. Another example of a sex-linked character is baldness. Baldness. Now, baldness is an, is an abnormality that involves the inability of the hair to grow on the upper part of the head. Inability of hair 
to grow on the upper part of the head. As you can see, mostly this happens to males. It happens mostly to males. Now, the recessive gene that the recessive gene causes the hair to pull off prematurely. That's what really happens. And this is often common, of course, in males. It's mostly found in males. So that is baldness. Another thing, again, we see, another sex-linked um, character is sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia. Now, sickle cell anemia is a condition that is caused by recessive gene. Please note that. It is caused by recessive gene, which causes the red blood cells to become sickle in shape. Now, if you look at the, the um, structure of the red blood cells, it, it is spherical, okay? It is spherical. Um, it is not sickle. Now, once it assumes the shape of or becomes sickle, it now uh, uh, causes a kind of problem. Now, the hemoglobin in sickle-shaped red blood cells are inefficient in transporting oxygen. They are inefficient in transporting oxygen. Remember that hemoglobin have strong affinity for oxygen and it aids the transportation Yes, it aids the transportation of oxygen from the lungs to all other parts of the body. So when the uh, uh, hemoglobin is inefficient in carrying out this function of transportation, it is as a result, mostly as a result of the shape of the red blood cell. So if the shape of the red blood cell is sickle, then there is going to be a big problem. Of course, you know this, that Oxygen is very vital for mostly in terms of, let me explain it in terms of humans, oxygen is very vital. Now, oxygen helps to break down complex food substances in order to release energy. Now, when the hemoglobin is inefficient in transporting oxygen, it simply means it will, it will bring about um, um, the weakness in the body, yes, it can bring about weakness in the body because the body is not able to carry out its major functions because energy is lacking. Energy is lacking. Now, a sickled, a sickled red blood cell blocks also the cavity of small blood vessels, blocks the cavity of small blood vessels in the body, thereby hindering the free, free flow of blood. So that is also another thing that the sickle cell, red blood cell, sorry, the sickle red blood cell does. Apart, apart from inefficient transportation of oxygen by the hemoglobin, it also blocks small blood vessels, and so there is no free flow of blood. Now, parts of the body affected receive inefficient, insufficient blood, oxygen, and also nutrients. This is also, this is also characterized by pains in the bones and joints okay so once this happens you start the person feels so much pains in the bones and also pains at the joint so you can see the structure that is a normal red blood cell that is the shape and the structure of a normal red blood cell and that is the shape and also the structure of a sickled red blood cell a sickled red blood cell. So that's what causes, or that is what we know as the sickle cell anemia disease. Now, number five is um, another characteristics, or sorry, another sex-linked characteristics, and that is albinism. Albinism. Now, albinism is actually a condition in which the skin of an animal is non-pigmented. Now, what we don't mean by non-pigmented, it means it has no color or it is lacking what we call melanin. It lacks melanin. Now, melanin is actually what gives the skin color we have. Okay? So, once an animal is lacking melanin, it simply means that that animal can be referred to as an albini albino or albinism. That's what brings about albinism. As you can see on the screen there, that is albinism, the lack of melanin. All right? Now, next thing we have just finished talking about um, uh, sex-linked characteristics. 
So those are the sex link characters. There's five of them. All right. Now, application of principles of heredity. Remember, we said that heredity is applied in everything we do. It has both good and bad effects, but we're going to be looking at some of the applications of the principles of hereditary. Now, one application of the principle of hereditary is cross and self-fertilization. Cross and self-fertilization. You can also call it cross and self pollination. Now, what is cross-fertilization? Now, cross-fertilization is actually the fertilization of a plant as a result of the fusion or as a result of the fusion of the gametes from another plant but of the same species. So, two different plants, they are of the same species, they are crossing or fertilizing. Now, I can, you, can, you can see on the screen there, we have a, a, a plant. We can call this, um, I think that should be Pride of Barbados. Then we have two different Pride of Barbados. Now, the pollen grains, which is actually the male um, gametes, is, is being transferred, is moved from that particular plant A, and it is going to fertilize the stigma of another plant. It is also known as pollination. Cross-fertilization can also be referred to as um, um, cross-pollination, okay? So it is actually um, the fertilization of one plant by another plant. Fertilization of one plant by another plant, but of the same species. Now, advantages of cross-fertilization. One, cross-fertilization leads to the production of healthier offsprings. It leads to the production of healthier offspring. It also produces viable seeds. The seeds that are resulting from cross-fertilization are viable. They are alive. They are active. Okay? They are healthy and strong. So they produce viable seeds. And number three advantage of cross-fertilization is that it leads to the formation of new varieties with good characteristics. Formation of new varieties with good characteristics. Now, self-fertilization. Self-fertilization. Self-fertilization is just the opposite of cross-fertilization. It can also be called self-pollination. So, self-fertilization is um, the fertilization of a plant as a result of the fusion of the gametes or fusion of gametes from the same plant. So, the fusion takes place in the same plant. So pollen grains from a particular plant fuses or fertilizes the, the, the stigma of that same plant. So that is self-fertilization. As you can see there, pollen grains coming out from the anther and then coming into the stigma of the same plant of the same plant in cross-pollination it has to do with of the same species but different plants but this one it is of the same plant now what are the advantages of self-fertilization self-fertilization it leads to the production of a pure breed line a pure breed line for instance if the plant per se is a tall plant it will still breed a tall plant okay so and you have um, long generations, if it continues, if self-fertilization continues, you will have long generations of pure breed plants, tall plants, okay? Or pure breed generations of tall plants. Number two advantage of self-fertilization is that breeds with required characteristics are produced. Yes, breeds with required characteristics are produced. And number three is that it helps to concentrate and preserve specific qualities in animals as well as in plants. So these are some of the advantages of self-fertilization. But self-fertilization, we're also going to be looking at some disadvantages just probably two disadvantages of self-fertilization. Number one is that self-fertilization leads to the production of weak offsprings. They lead to the production of weak offsprings. And then number two, they lead to the production or offsprings produced are less adaptive to their environment. Less adaptive to their environment because they are weak. 
okay? So these are some of the disadvantages of self-fertilization. Another application of, of um, the principle of heredity is inbreeding and outbreeding. Inbreeding and outbreeding. Now, what is inbreeding? Inbreeding involves the mating of more closely related animals. Mating of more closely related animals. An example is between a father and a daughter, a son and a mother. Okay? So, you, when, when, when you see such kind of um, conditions, we call that inbreeding. In breeding, in breeding is a type of breeding between closely related individuals. All right. Now we also have advantages. There are some advantages, and also there are some disadvantages of this type of breeding. Now in breeding, let's look at some of the advantages. It helps to produce pure breeds, just the same way we saw, or just the same way we saw in self fertilization. It helps to produce pure breeds which can be used for crossbreeding to produce hybrid vigor, all right? Number two, it enables a desired character to be developed. And then number three, it helps to concentrate and preserve specific qualities in an animal. And then the disadvantage of inbreeding is that it leads to the production of weak offsprings. Production of weak offsprings. And number two disadvantage, it produces offsprings with undesirable characteristics. Undesirable characteristics. Then, the next one is outbreeding. Outbreeding. Now, outbreeding involves the mating of unrelated animals within the same breed or species. Mating of unrelated animals within the same species. They are of the same species. Now, you can see an example of outbreeding. We have um, probably, let's say, um, an example of outbreeding. We have an example of outbreeding. We have a, a, a horse mating with actually a donkey. Now, the resulting offspring is going to be a mule, okay? A mule, having some characteristics of a horse and also having some characteristics of a donkey. So that is an example of outbreeding. Now, the advantages of outbreeding is that it produces offsprings that are superior to the average of either parents. Offsprings that are superior to the average of either parents. And number two is that the offsprings grow more rapidly. The offsprings grow more rapidly. And then number three is that offsprings can withstand variations within the environment, can withstand variations within the environment. Now you see that mostly happen around us. Most persons cross um, dogs, of different breeds, different of they are of the same species. They are all dogs, but you have a, a kind of difference within them, and you you have a a hybrid. Okay, now disadvantages of outbreeding: breeds may not be easily available. Yes, the breeds you desire may not be easily available. Experts may not be easily what also available to help in such crossbreeding between um, these different animals, okay? So these are some of the disadvantages of outbreeding, all right? Then we're going to be looking at another aspect of, or another application of the principle of heredity. The another application is agriculture. Heredity can be applied in agriculture. It can be applied to increase the yield in crops. It has helped also to improve the quality of products of crops, that's the quality of the crop, the yield of the crop. It has helped also to develop what we call disease resistant varieties in crops. There are some crops now that can resist pests, that can resist some diseases and all that. So it is based on the application of the principles of what? Heredity. It has also helped 
in, in agriculture. It has also helped in the production of crops and animals that can adapt to climatic conditions. Okay, based on this inbreeding and also out breathing. Now you can see we have global uh, next generation genetic engineering in agriculture and so on. We're still going to be talking about genetic engineering much later. Now also, um, uh, 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 another application of um, another application of uh, the principle of heredity is in medicine. Uh, uh, um, genetics has helped so much in medicine. It has helped in the determination of the paternity of a child. Yes, it has helped in the determination of the paternity of a child. For instance, a woman can give birth, maybe has um, a multiple um, affairs and may not know, um, may be pregnant in, during these affairs and um, may not know or doesn't know the uh, um, um, rightful um, father to the, to the, to the child or uh, probably a child is actually looking for um, who is the father and all that, um, it can be determined easily in the hospital by the principle of genetics or heredity. Another one again is that genetics has helped in blood transfusion. It has helped to save lives in blood transfusion. And of course, before you transfuse blood, based on blood transfusion, we have different blood groups. Of course, we have blood group A, we have blood group B, blood group AB, and blood group O. Now, O is regarded as a universal donor. It can give blood to every blood group, okay, a universal donor, but it can only receive blood from blood group O. Please listen again. Blood group O is a universal donor. It simply means it can give blood to all the groups but can only receive blood from blood group O. Blood group AB is a universal receptor, or you can call it a universal recipient. It can receive blood from every other group, but can only give out to blood group AB. Okay, can only give out blood to AB. Um, blood uh, genetics has also helped in marriage counseling. In marriage counseling for instance if a man who is um, AS um, wanting to get married to a woman who is also AS uh, genetically speaking it is actually a, a risk to take okay it is risk is a big risk for them to marry and um, because the resulting offsprings some of the one of the outcomes or possibility there's a, so a possibility that can, they can give rise to a child with sickle cell anemia okay that has ss a sickle celled child so uh, 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 the determination of um, or actually the principle of genetics has helped so much in marriage counseling knowing whom to get married Two. Another thing again, a, a, a genetics has helped is it has helped in the diagnosis of diseases. It has helped in the diagnosis of diseases. Also, it has helped in crime detection. It has helped in crime detection. To the most crimes, people, robberies, rapes, and so on, can be detected. The person, the culprits, can be caught using genetics. You can use their blood groups. You can also use their fingerprints and so on. It can help in crime detection. It has also helped in the development of test tube babies. Development of test tube babies. We will be discussing that much later when we talked about when we're going to be looking at reproduction in humans. Reproduction in humans. We're going to be talking about test tube babies. But it has helped in the production of test tube babies babies that's helped in the development of test tube babies and um, it has also helped uh, to know the sex of a baby after fertilization remember we've just talked about um, I think in previous videos we've discussed um, determination of sex in um, humans also another application another application of um, the principles of genetics or hereditary in medicine is that it has helped couples to choose the sex of a baby through a technique we call sperm separation technique. 
sperm separation technique. So one can actually choose, one can actually decide the, the, the sex of the baby one desires, okay? But it's actually, I think, very expensive. So sperm separation technique it is. Now, finally, we're going to be looking at what we call genetic engineering. If you could remember when I was discussing um, the application of um, heritry in agriculture, I mentioned genetic engineering. Now let's take a little or a brief um, look at what genetic engineering is all about. Now what is genetic engineering? Genetic engineering is a type of biotechnology in which selected useful genes, selected useful genes from an organism is transferred into a, another organism by man. So it is a, a, a segment of the DNA is being removed that is useful and then it is being transmitted or transferred into another or organism. For instance, we can have um, um, genetic engineering of um, production of um, growth hormones. We can get it and then inject into someone that is a dwarf. We're going to be looking at some examples. Now, please note something. Genetic engineering can also be called recombinant DNA technology. Recombinant DNA technology. It's a very wonderful course to actually study. Now, uh, it is also important to understand this, that during genetic engineering, uh, uh, the main aim for the aim of genetic engineering to be achieved, DNA used as vehicles must be taken from organisms such as plasmids or bacteriophage. Okay, whose DNA can replicate independent of the host DNA. Now, let me, let me show you more how this works. Let's see how this actually works. Now, production of human growth hormone. We can produce human growth hormone and use it to treat someone that is a, a dwarf. We can use it to treat dwarfism in humans. Yes, we can. Now, this is the process. Now, the first process is that the DNA loop, a DNA loop is taken from a plasmid. <clears throat> that is, useful DNA loop is taken from a plasmid. And this uh, DNA loop is opened and a segment of DNA from a human that produces growth hormone is joined to it. Now, please take note, this plasmid is gotten from anywhere. So once we get the plasmid and then we open the plasmid, we can then incorporate a, 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 a segment of DNA from a human that produces. Remember, we want to look at how to produce human growth hormones. We can get it and then use that DNA and incorporate it to the uh, to the to the plasmid to the loop of that from that plasmid. Now, once it is successful, this engineered DNA is then inserted into a bacterium cell. Is inserted into a bacterium cell. Now, of course, we know that bacteria ba bacteria actually they replicate. They undergo the process of replications, okay, or reproduction, and they reproduce by binary fission, very fast. Now, as this bacterium cell replicates, now as this bacterium cell uh, reproduce in a fermenter, why do we use fermenters? Now, fermenters are mostly used because bacterium cells, they replicate or reproduce faster in bacterium uh, in, in fermenters. So, when this uh, um, engineered DNA is inserted into the bacterium cell, and this bacterium cell are, pro are, are now placed in the fermenter, the bacterium cells undergo reproduction. As they are reproducing, the engineered DNA that is inside of this bacterium cell also repl replicates. And also, as it is replicating, giving rise to daughter cells, those daughter cells are carriers of those engineered DNA. They become carriers. Those en engineered DNA are incorporated into those daughter cells. Now, these uh, daughter cells, 
now carry growth hormones. And these growth hormones are produced and can be extracted from time to time from the fermenters and they can be used to treat dwarfism in humans. They can be used to treat dwarfism in humans. Now take a look at the screen. You can see that we have a plasmid. A plasmid has been taken, you can see it from E. coli bacteria and that plasmid has been used for something else now, look at the implantation. The growth hormone has been growth hormone producing gene has been implanted. Now they have put it inside of the bacteria. Now that implantation was successful. See what happens. The production of growth hormones. So growth hormones are being produced because as the cell or, or the bacterium cells are ac actually producing those growth hormones are as, as they are reproducing rather those growth hormones are also replicating as you can see then we now have a cultural media full of what growth hormones and this can be used later to treat like i said it can be extracted from time to time extracted and that's what we have as protropines it can be extracted from time to time from this bacteria or from the fermenter and then used to treat dwarfism in humans so this is some of the ways through which um, this thing can be possible genetic engineering is so wonderful now let's take a look at few applications of genetic engineering number one genetic engineering engineering can be used to improve the yield and health of plants by changing their DNA, their genes, rather than using artificial selection, which is no longer, which is a, a longer process, is a longer process. So in other words, we use genetic engineering to improve their yield. We can also use genetic engineering to improve their health, the health of plants. Now, genetic engineering can also be used to produce vaccines. We've just seen one where we talked about the protropines. It can be used to produce vaccines for treating hemolytic, uh, sorry, hemophiliac whose blood, uh, uh, blood really clots. They can be used to treat patients that have hemophilia. And of course, you know what hemophilia is. We said hemophilia is a condition in which the blood is unable to what? clot. We can produce vaccines. We can produce vaccines that will help treat people that are having hemophilia. And then lastly, it can be used to produce cereal plants which could fix their own nitrogen by introducing nitrogen fixing gene from bacteria into them. Now, this would increase the yield and nutrient level of such plants and also reduce the use of artificial fertilization. So these are some of the applications of genetic engineering. This is where we call it a wrap up. But before we go, I want us to look at very few questions based on what we have discussed just now. Now, quickly, let's look at um, UTME 2022. And um, let's take a look at some questions here. Now, look at this. They said the condition in which the skin is non-pigmented, I mentioned this, because of lack of melanin is known as, it's not known as cretinism. It is also not known, known as baldness. It is not hemophilia, but that is what albinism. So albinism is the correct answer B. Now, look at the next one. An accurate indication of a sorry, an accurate identification of a rapist can be carried out by conducting DNA analysis. DNA analysis. Remember, we talked about the application of the principle of heredity in medicine. And we said one of them is to detect crime. It helps in, the, in crime detection. Mostly robbers, um, rapists, and so on they can be detected by DNA analysis, all right? Fingerprints, blood, and all that. Good. Next one says, genetically modified food products have not been, yes, have not become universally accepted, yes, because I think it is not because they are not tasty. The technology can be applied only in developed countries. That's not true. Their effects on human consumers is not fully understood, yes. So their effect on human consumers is not fully 
understood. And that is why um, genetically modified food products have not become universally accepted. In some countries, they're still making use of it, but it is not universally accepted. Next, when a colorblind man marries a carrier woman, that is a woman that has the gene of colorblindness, what is the probability of their offspring being colorblind? Probability of their offspring being colorblind. Now, the correct answer is 50%. Now, let's take an instance. If the person, that, the man that is colorblind, as it is dominant, let's call it big B, big B. Marries a woman that is a carrier, big B, small B. Once there is a crossing, we have the resulting offspring, that's the F1 generation, will be big B, big B. We have big B, small B, big B, big B, and big B, small B. So we have a, a, a ratio of 2 is to 2. Okay, that's the same thing as 50-50. So there are, there's a 50% chance that, that they will have a child or their offspring will be colorblind like the father. And there is also 50% chance that, um, that their offspring will also be a carrier like the mother. So the correct answer is 50%. And then we have an example of a sex-linked trait is example of a sex-linked trait. Remember I talked about sex linkage. Now, A, they said possession of facial hair in adult humans. B, they said ability to grow long hair in females. And then C, they said color, color of the skin in humans. And then D is ability to roll the tongue. The correct answer is possession of facial hair in adults. Possession of facial hair in adults. Now let's take a look at question six. That says sex linked genes. Very correct. Sex linked genes are located on, is it on the X chromosome? Is it on the Y chromosomes? Is it homologous chromosomes? Is it on the X and Y chromosomes? I told you while we were discussing, I said sex linked genes are genes that are located on the X chromosomes. They are located on the X chromosomes. Finally, an example of a sex-linked trait is the same answer. It is option B. So you can see there are small questions to um, actually look into. Please try your hands on more of these questions. Well, I think this is where we'll call it a wrap-up for today. We'll see you in our next class. Bye for now.